It's June 27th, 2022, and this is the Watson Weekly, your essential e-commerce digest. Today on our show, Global E acquires Border Free in further consolidation of the cross-border market. eBay acquires NFT marketplace Known Origin as part of its metaverse investments. Walmart and Roku team up on bringing commerce to the TV. Amazon shuffles its consumer team leadership and appoints Doug Harrington leader of stores worldwide. And finally, the Investor Minute, which contains five items this week from the world of venture capital, acquisitions, and IPOs. But first, in our shopping cart full of news, Global E acquires Border Free in further consolidation of the cross-border market. Border Free has a long history, both ups and downs here. I worked there for about three years as part of the Pitney Bowes post-acquisition. The history of the Border Free brand itself started as part of Canada Post originally, and there was a very complex and sordid history between Pitney Bowes, Canada Post, and Border Free. I seriously have an email in my inbox from Craig Reed in about 2001 from Craig at Border Free, truly one of the OGs of the whole market. Anywho, the company got its start as a foreign exchange hedging platform E4X in Israel. The company later became 51.com, Canada being the 51st state after all, and then rebranded to become Border Free, acquiring the name from Canada Post. Suffice to say, Border Free invented Global E's model and killed many other cross-border companies on the way to its IPO, which was incidentally one of the most perfectly timed IPOs at a time of extremely low value of the dollar and low tariffs, which is great for cross-border. What does Global E get for this? Primarily Macy's and Nordstrom's and maybe Crate and Barrel. And I'm sure they would have liked to got Neiman's as well, but Farfetch picked them off earlier. There are many border-free customer names which are not enterprise level, which will probably be moved to a more flow-like solution as they are not high volume enough to support on the border-free model. Who's the biggest loser in this? I would think ESW. Anything that makes Global E stronger puts pressure on ESW, who recently, incidentally, acquired ScaleFast to expand their portfolio. Odds are, I'm not sure this acquisition will be the best culture mesh. One other thing I'm happy to see... Both Globally and Border Free were originally founded in Israel, and so many of the original employees now get to reunite. Congrats to both teams. Our second story. eBay acquires NFT marketplace Known Origin as part of its metaverse investments. eBay this past week acquired an NFT marketplace property called Known Origin for an undisclosed amount. While NFTs do serve some purpose, the whole space on has fallen on hard times because, well, you know, the value of an NFT is not based on anything. The clue to this whole acquisition is buried in the press release, whereby you notice that the price of the acquisition is not disclosed. This tells you that it was an aqua hire, and essentially that the press value of being somewhere near the NFT space is actually greater than the expected value of the software acquired. Ultimately, eBay has a very poor record of aqua hiring other marketplaces, so I actually hope that they shut it down for its own sake. In other collectibles related news, I want to also mention eBay's physical investments in storage related to collectibles, namely the eBay Vault. Just like it sounds, it is a physical vault designed to store high-value collectibles in a secure, temperature, humidity, and light-controlled environment. Unlike its NFT acquisition, I think the vault is a good idea for eBay. One of the biggest problems with eBay people is that they don't have the resources to keep valuable trading cards in near-mint condition. It also prevents the cards from being shipped around unnecessarily if the buyer doesn't need the card physically immediately. If this is a value stream that its sellers and buyers can get behind, eBay could gain more revenue from these transactions. Of course, Fanatics is owning the IP for many of these cards anyway, so they're still winning here too. Our third story. Walmart and Roku team up on bringing commerce to the TV. Recently, Walmart announced a new partnership with Roku set-top boxes, which has a number of elements with it. Product discovery and product purchase will happen on the Roku device itself. And also learned that this is using Roku's advertising stack and not Walmart's, all without the awkward reliance on QR codes. A few points on this partnership. First, anything has to be better than Walmart's previously ill-fated partnership with Vudu for TV. I don't think everyone ever watched Vudu. Second, Programmatic video ads is a huge growth area in advertising, and Walmart has no exposure to it. Roku has long been an independent player, and this is an interesting market to experiment with. Third, Walmart's direct competitor Amazon has a clear path to programmatic video and e-commerce that Walmart has no access to. As far as I'm concerned, this is a dress rehearsal for an acquisition by Walmart for Roku's programmatic video ad platform. 
And given that Roku controls about 51% of the streaming box market in the US, the success of this could be important for both sides. So while this is an experiment, I would put this into the important experiment bucket because of its potential implications in the future. And our last story. Amazon shuffles its consumer team leadership and appoints Doug Harrington leader of stores worldwide. Well, Andy Jassy certainly isn't wasting any time after the departure of Dave Clark. Here are the announced changes. First, they changed the name of the group from the consumer group to the stores group. Originally, I was quite confused at why they did this, but my secret sources tell me that legal is behind it. Apparently, they think that if Amazon's divisions sound more like a traditional retailer, Lena Khan and other FTC regulators will be fooled. Apparently, Amazon's legal team has an extremely dim view of regulators, who, by the way, are also lawyers. What a tremendous misdirection. I was almost fooled myself. Anywho, in case you were wondering, Doug Harrington is the direct replacement for Dave Clark as the CEO of Worldwide Amazon Stores. So this is a very mainstream pick for the replacement, and there is not a tremendous reshuffling or reimagination happening here. Third, John Felton is a senior VP of Global Delivery has been appointed to lead all of operations at Amazon. John and his career had been Dave Clark's primary financial partner for years and has been operating the business more recently. Fourth, Christine Beauchamp, formerly the president of fashion, but more recently the SVP of consumer categories, was appointed to Doug Harrington's old role as head of North American stores. A number of other changes were announced, but these were the major ones. What does this tell us? First, I think Andy Jassy has known about Dave Clark's departure for months and has worked out the succession plan not only for him, but his entire management team. Second, this is a huge step in validation for Christine Beauchamp, who came into Amazon with a fashion background, but has quickly applied her skills across all categories. Previously, she was running the business side of these categories, but now takes over the technology as well. Third, and the most interesting part of this announcement to me was John Felton running all operations at Amazon. If you look at John's background, he has about three years recently as the leader of delivery services group, and the rest of his long career at Amazon is as the primary finance partner to operations leadership. I was most interested in who would land as the fulfillment leader here and what it would say about the future. John Felton's appointment definitely fits more in the Tim Cook style of leader, financially and operationally focused rather than a logistics builder. Given Dave Clark's departure and his comments about building, this is not all that surprising, especially given all the network optimization that needs to be done at Amazon. Overall, a lot of this just gives you insight into just how truly deep Amazon's leadership bench is compared to others in the space. When one executive leaves, many others are ready and willing to step into the void. It's that time, friends, for our Investor Minute. We had five items on the menu today. First, Bold Metrics secures $8 million in Series A funding in order to build its AI body modeling technology platform. There have been a few companies working on this type of scanning technology, which all have the goal to improve fit and reduce returns. Second, Chain.io closes an $11 million Series A financing to deliver better data integration and visibility across the global supply chain. Unlike other companies like Flexport that are focused on physical assets, Chain.io is focused solely on an easy integration platform between all partners in the supply chain, between logistics service providers, shipping companies, and software platforms. Third. Cloud-based POS system Predict Spring raises $16 million in Series B funding. I think Predict Spring is a super interesting next-generation player in the POS market. It's starting to make a lot of noise by combining POS, clienteling, inventory management, and order management. Fourth, Brandtech Group acquires e-commerce marketing platform Acorn Intelligence for over $50 million. Acorn Intelligence has clients such as Adidas and Microsoft and help clients in Amazon and direct-to-consumer advertising scenarios. And finally, Allison Felix's Seish footwear brand raises $8 million in a Series A. For those who didn't know who Allison Felix was, she's a track and field athlete in the 200 and 400 meter events. One interesting point here is the gap as an investor, and so this could also get the brand into Athleta and other outlets. That's all for this week. Till next time, Watsonians. Hi, I'm Rick Watson. CEO and founder of RMW Commerce Consulting and host of the Watson Weekly Podcast, your essential e-commerce digest. Our show is produced by Citizen Racecar. Garrett Tiedemann is a producer. Alex Brower wrote our theme music. The executive producer is David Hoffman. To hear new episodes of the show every Monday morning, subscribe now at rmwcommerce.com slash Watson Weekly and wherever you get your podcasts.